of the Center for Excellence in Preaching and on behalf of Calvin Theological Seminary generally, um, it is uh, my pleasure to welcome to our 2007 Fall Preaching Conference Dr. Todd Farley. Dr. Farley is currently an Associate Professor of Communication, Arts, and Sciences right here at Calvin College. Prior to his taking a two-year appointment here at Calvin, Todd studied at Fuller Theological Seminary in Pasadena, California. At Fuller, he received a Master's of Theology degree in 2001 in a degree program that focused on biblical studies and theology. And then in 2006, he earned a PhD at Fuller where his doctoral work focused on the area of theology and culture. But before he took on those theological studies, Todd spent about five years studying theater and drama, most particularly the art form of pantomime or mime. From 1984 to 1987, he pursued those studies in Paris at the International School of Mind Drama under the instruction of no less than the world-renowned mime artist Marcel Marceau. While in Paris, Todd studied a full range of dramatic arts. In fact, commenting on Todd's work, the master teacher Marcel Marceau once said, And that, by the way, was his highest form of praise. <laughs> but in all seriousness, Marcel Marceau, uh, who passed away very recently, as you know, uh, Marcel Marceau did stay in touch with Todd and with his wife, Marilyn, over the years. Todd and Marilyn went on to form a mime ministry, aptly named Mimestry International. And in 2002, Marcel Marceau publicly acclaimed and recognized Mimestry as one of the leading schools for drama and mime in the world. And Todd has indeed traveled the world, leading workshops and performing in a bevy of dramatic performances. In fact, he has given presentations, lectures, and performances all through Europe, in Singapore, the Philippines, Korea, Russia, South America, Norway, Mexico, Malaysia, Australia, and many other places besides. He's also written numerous scholarly articles as well as encyclopedia entries and is a past director of the Institute of Dramatic Arts at the Brehm Center for Worship and Theology at Fuller Theological Seminary. It goes without saying that uh, Todd's talents and insights are rich and varied. Today, as he's already said, he's going to talk to us about embodying the sermon by helping us to focus on the nonverbal parts of the pastor's toolkit. So we are so pleased and happy to welcome Dr. Todd Farley and I invite you to join me in doing that right now. So we find ourselves behind a podium, and usually a larger one than this. Sometimes we find ourselves sort of more looking over the podium. Many times that functions as if it were a barrier between us and the people. And many times we think because we stand behind a podium, our bodies are not seen, and in some podiums that's the case. But as soon as you walk up and you stand at this place to present the word of the Lord to the people, the people are seeing you as well as hearing you. So this first session, we're going to discuss what is possible for the preacher, the teacher, the minister of the word, and how that minister uses their body to communicate ideas and thoughts to the congregation. And some of this is going to be uh, rather pedantic, rather educational, you know, the type of thing that, that you don't use to entertain a crowd. So please bear with me as we sort of go through some of the, the basics of body communication. First off, there is a concept that was said by one of my mentors, Charles Bartow, who said that through performance, scriptural text evokes worlds of human being, real enough for people to enter, to believe in, and to be changed by. Here's the concept. There are some texts that we find in front of us, and there are many texts that we read, where those texts were once alive. 
They were words spoken, actions done, things seen. We read in scripture by word, by the necessity that they didn't have video or camera or music that we can record. And so we read life that has been poured into ink onto a page. And we as ministers take that ink that is before us, that we have read and the congregations read, and we try to extract it and to put the blood back into it, that that ink might once again breathe with life to the listener. We have learned this in our homiletics classes, to do it in our words, in our rhythms, in our phrases, our tones. We have learned how to structure our speeches, and we have practiced how to use a manuscript, or how to speak from an outline, or how to speak extemporaneously, or even the improvis improvisationally. But have we learned how to use our hands? Or how to stand. For a lot of our communication is what they are seeing and not just what they're hearing. So for the next, oh, they're about 40 minutes, 45 minutes, and we'll have times for questions. I'm going to take you on a journey into the body and the possibility of body communication. There are a couple things that we need to know about the body. First off, you don't have to be an artist. In fact, I don't expect you to be an artist. And yet you still have a body. And they still observe you. So we're not talking in this, this session about the artistic pastor. I, I am not talking this session about those of you who feel that artistic urge. Oh, oh, raise your hand, I see that hand. And we're not talking about that. We are talking about being human. The fact that God, in his wisdom, gave us this rather clumsy, maladroit, hard to share, hard to communicate body. And that through that vessel of clay, you hold such a treasure of anointing and expression to the people. So let's learn what this body does for every single one of us, without exception. Every single one of us, every speaker, whoever stands before a crowd has a body. And therefore, these truths can be applied across the board, internationally. First thing that we have to concentrate on is, is understanding the primary stance. Understanding that each of us have a zero, a beginning place, a posture. I'm going to look at a couple different things. The first thing is the fact that, you're have, that you have a posture base. Some of you like this. There you come. Now, depending on that posture base, the audience already starts to read intelligence, or lack thereof. <laughs> <laughs> and so I would suggest some molding of the body. And, and that is just to stand up straight. Now, you don't have to stand up overly. You don't have to be a ballet dancer, you know. But to stand up straight and to support yourself. Now, the benefit of this is by that posture of attention. It shows the, the congregation that I am ready and indeed prepared. If I, my posture is here, oh, poor guy, let me bring you a chair. If my posture is stooped and worried and burdened, furthermore, the next question is, what do I do when I want to be expressing something that is burdened? I need to have what we call a zero. And from that anti-physical canvas, the preacher's zero allows me to journey into varied expressions, both positive, negative, uh, forward, backward, and we'll look at these. So the first thing is, is to find your zero, that place where you're comfortable. Now, as a dancer, I almost inadvertently go to a first position where my feet are like this. 
Uh, that's not natural, so you don't have to do that. But just your, your feet, shoulders width apart underneath you. And if you have a little bit of natural turnout, which some of us do, let it be. And stand there upright. Now, I should probably already start to say something about the feet, and you can't quite see them, unfortunately. But with my feet together, well, let us explore something. Would you see a guard standing like this? Now, I'm on my toes, if you can't see that. Does a guard stand on his toes? No. And why not? Go ahead, you're going to participate. Why doesn't a guard stand on his toes? Sorry? Can't keep it up for very long? It's what? Imbalanced. He doesn't look intimidating. Doesn't look intimidating. All right. So I don't look as intimidating like this, eh? <laughs> Not very guard-like, am I? No, indeed. But the interesting about it, thing about it is that it has no reality to the threat that the guard would be to you. And yet if you saw a guard standing like this, you wouldn't be very threatened. It is only perception. For if that person was Van Damme, he's still going to hurt you when you get close. <laughs> <laughs> but we are a people of appearance. And we perceive by your body position strength and weakness. And that elevated foot is of the air. When we think about feet, positions, on eleve is whenever we're speaking of air. We, we think of angels up here, you know. We think of, of, of divine things that are elevated. We think of earth on the ground, flat-footed. So we expect the, the speaker to be flat-footed, planted. He's human, not an angel. We want him strong, not airy. Nor, down here, plie, I'm like rooted, I'm like grabbing the ground. So the concept of the bent leg is to grab the ground. And there's times when I anchor in, times when I'm just standing. Now the other thing about that guard, feet together doesn't seem very possessive. Isn't it interesting that in the Old Testament, it was said that whatever the Jew could tread, the promise was, wherever your feet shall trod, there you shall possess the land. That the feet, for the Hebrew, was a sign of ownership and possession. Likewise, our feet today represent our dominion, our domain, our possession, or our expression of possessiveness. When my feet are close together, I don't claim much ground. Somebody could stand here and somebody could stand there. If I put my foot, my feet, in a second position, this position with the feet apart, widely apart, now a person can't stand there and cannot stand there, for I possess the land. Therefore, a wide foot stance becomes domineering and dominant. If I want to communicate a concept, therefore, to the listener that I am simply present, my feet are together, if I become dominant in my statement, my feet will take a second position. And that second position communicates the concept to the observer, whether they realize it or not, of someone taking space, taking ground, standing on their ground. Now, that position is still non-aggressive. It's just simply possessive. If I change just my foot position from that second position to a fourth position, what happens? I heard it somewhere. Here I am passive, I am simply possessive. And here, I start to become aggressive. I start to take the ground aggressively. You're preaching, and all of a sudden you're doing these little things like this, these little lunges, like someone fencing. <laughs> and the audience is going, Because they read each time you lunge forward with that idea, 
that you're giving them something or aggressing against something. It might be either one. That's quite different than I take my ground to say it strongly. Now that, that position again has relied on a second thing. We've, we've now talked about the feet and how they are a symbol of possession and how small ideas, our internal ideas, find themselves with the feet close together and how possessive ideas or dominant ideas find themselves with the feet apart. And that aggression happens when I step forward and have my body wait for it. All these are just in your feet, which you don't even think about. But the audience reads, just as you read that a guard would not stand like this. That perception is so many times unspoken and yet a reality of what they're receiving and or contradicting you are contradicting and what you're saying. Now, my équilibre, which is the French for balance, the équilibre is found in many times we have different stances of our balance, that forward équilibre, central équilibre, and backward équilibre. With a forward équilibre, I have one idea, central and back. Now, what would it be? What would you say if I was to say one was aggressive, one was neutral, and one was withdrawn? Which was which? Which was the, uh, which is this one? That's with me. Neutral. Okay, good. And what about this one? Withdrawn. All right, what about this one? Aggressive or engaged. With just my physical posturing, I, uh, with just the the, the angle of my body, I am communicating thought and idea that without any further training, you already knew. But how many of you actually think about it when you lean forward? How much of that is actually trained? So, if I'm going to engage my audience, I might lean forward. And you saw me as I was preaching, many times leaning towards you, and then pulling away as I allowed you to think about what I said. I would give you an idea and then leave it there. That with gesture. And what happens is the audience, the congregation reads it as such. They have a given idea that now he's giving me a breath to think about. Now, I can do that physically as I did in this morning's example where I gave you an idea, I came all the way forward, I turned my back on you, walked away, and left the idea with you over there to think about, to ponder. Now, curiously, we haven't talked about this side or this side. What is that all about? So we have this leaning forward where I engage or give or perhaps aggress. I have this neutral stance where I simply am ready and am present. And this backward one where I'm pulling away or drawing back or recoiling, depending on the context. And then we have these side to sides. <laughs> well, that's better than have, trying to have you guys do this. <laughs> But, you, you know, where you, you lean sideways. and you th What are you doing when you lean sideways? What do you think? Thinking. What do you think? Indeed, because we think of time and engagement of thought on a process. Can someone, uh, from where you're at, can you point to your future, please? Point as if the future exists. Oh. Okay, point to your past, please. Oh, my goodness. Point to the promises of God. Okay, God word are around us. We think directionally. And we place many concepts in space, in a spatial relationship. There are times where we think of the future as ahead of us and the past behind us. And so when I engage and I'm speaking about a future promise, I'm usually leaning forward. And when I'm talking about yesterday and about something that happened or, or some, the promises of yesterday that we realize today, I take it from the past and bring it to the present. So that body position becomes an alignment and of concepts of time. Past, present, and future. 
Sometimes as I start to talk about the promises of God and I start to bring them and I start to take them and bring them close. And I can do that supported with my gesture as well as my words. Yes, it's, it's, it's out there, but grab a hold of it. And bring it home. Bring it to yourself. Acquire it. It's for you to take. Etc. Etc. So, concepts of time are also found inside of that. When I go sideways, I'm taking myself off the timeline to reflect. So, I, I say something forward, I leave it there, and I think about it. Now, my posture becomes the posture for the people. The speaker's posture becomes a reflection of what the people, how the people respond. So, as I've said something, I've given you a thought, I've drawn back, leaving the thought there, and I'm thinking about it, allowing you time to think about it. And then I come back to my center, and you go, oh, he's going to start again. She's going to start again. I need to listen once again to what she's going to say. And I pull up. So I allow, visually, without having to get it and wave their attention, I can say, think about that. So, and, and then go and continue on. And as soon as they see me straighten up, they know, oh, here we go again. Let's stop thinking about it. Now let me refocus on what's being said. Simply with your gesture. And simply with your posture here, your feet position, and your body orientation. Forward, center, backward, side to side. All of these things can be accomplished behind a podium. As I give an idea, as I pull back to center, as I pull away, as I go to the side of the podium, as I choose the other side for a second remark, and back to my center to go back into the body of the lecture. And in each place, we have journeyed physically as well as audibly. Let's go to the next item. We've talked about the feet, now we've talked about that body isolation, that ekelib, the balances. <clears throat> and both of these can be achieved behind a podium or without a podium. Those who walk and pace like myself are those who find themselves stagnant behind a pulpit. The point I would make is that each of us will have a different degree back to this preacher's zero. You've heard some preachers who just are just very, very loud gestorally. They are always gesturing. And some who are just calm and stand there with their podium and they speak like this and they're always very staid. Both of those are a zero. The speaker's zero. For the, the pastor who's so animated and, and is doing this, or, or she who is standing here like this, so collected, that's what becomes the norm for the listener. And that becomes their zero. So when the pastor stops, we pay attention. Well, they stop moving. <laughs> what did they say? And when all of a sudden that pastor here goes, <laughs> we laugh because it's terribly funny. <laughs> Both have approached it because the zero is what is the norm of your pattern Plus and minus. So your pattern, if we were to put a RIA set up from 0 to 10, 10 being highly active and 0 being dead, uh, <laughs> highly active to very little action, you probably fall somewhere between a 3 and a 7. Hopefully. If you're a 9 or a 10, we really hate to go to your sermons for a long period of time because we're always being screamed at. And if you're a 1, uh, it's a great place to sleep. <laughs> so you want to find that, that middle balance. And like I said, most of us could register between a three and a seven. And then those sevens only have about three more digits to go or two more, you know, a couple more to go up. So you really have to get loud to get excited. But their silence is really powerful. And that person who's a little bit more calm, when they get excited, boy, do we get excited because there's so much room for them to do that. Start to figure out, one of the things to ask is, what is the zero of the sermon? 
What is the movement of the sermon, and how does it find itself on a rheostat of movement and expression? And make sure that you've given yourself enough space to express the energy and the movement necessities of that sermon without yelling it the whole time or whispering it the whole time. But ask it of the text, what is your zero? And therefore, how do I as a speaker adjust my movement pattern to be appropriate to the text and to find that exploration? But one of the things that you want to do inside of discovering your zero is learn to be comfortable with what you do and to discipline what you do that is unnecessary. Learning your zero means that I can start to critique my zero as well. Do I speak with my hands? Do I not? How do I use my inflection? What is my vocal qualities? Yes. How do I stand? Am I always fidgeting? How do I, then I need to stand still. I need to learn how to stand still. Am I always gesturing? Do my gestures have meaning? Or are they just feeling noise in the space? And start to examine yourself and examine where you're going to be comfortable. Some of you will never be comfortable doing what I did this morning. And that is fine. We're not asking you to. Whilst others of you would find a freedom in being able to leave the pulpit and pace the floor. But that should never be pacing the floor. It should never be just because you're always like this. This means nothing to the audience. And they get really tired of seeing a pastor who just does this all the time. You know, they're going like this. I feel like I'm in a ping pong match. You know? <laughs> Tennis, anyone? Uh, you, it needs to be chosen. And that critique is essential to your, to your well-ministered physical voice. All right, leaving the zero and the concept of zero, let's go on with a body and, and discuss what the body means and how it unfolds in ideas and concepts. We'll start with the most communicative part outside of your face. Uh, face is considered the most communicative part of the, the body, especially for the speaker, because we're always looking at your eyes. We're reading how your mouth is moving. We're watching your expression. Yes, indeed, all those type of things. And we want it to be true and real, and you know that already. No, we don't want this. Good morning. It's nice to see you here. <laughs> no, obviously the face should be alive and real according to the emotion of, of, of the, the text and appropriate to the expression of the sermon. But these hands, you know, what do we do with them? And a lot of times we end up with speakers with what I call who knew hands because everything's like this, um, you know, and they sort of gesture clumsily. There's 99 hand positions that we mimes work with, 99. And I would like to share some of those hand positions with you. Now, let's first go to the Hebrew and the concept of what the, the body represents. It's, it's wonderful we have scripture to illuminate. And in fact, it illuminates very well what the body means. Because everything has a literal meaning. Oh, that's the hand. Oh, that's the head. Oh, that's the foot. Oh, that's the heart. But in each of those things is a symbolic meaning that unlocks the potential of that body in expression. And the word yad, hand, open hand, or kair in, in Greek, that open hand represents power, means, direction. I can close my hand and I contain all the power, means, and direction, and I pose it upon your face. Or I can open that hand and release that power, means, and direction. So we many times will stop a crowd with our power, means, and direction, or gather a crowd in with our power, means, and direction. We'll give them an idea and leave it there. Or we'll take something and hold it, an idea. We'll identify many things with our hands. First off, we identify orientation, a place with our hands. That in front, behind, side to side, heavenward, that orientation of time and the future of the past, of the present. We speak of the audience, we speak of the world out there, we speak of heaven, we speak of earth with our hands. 
Then we can also, with our hands, create our emphasis. For instance, if I have a general idea, my hands will usually be open with little design and wave in space. It's somewhere out, um, out, out, out there. So the hands communicate the idea of that imprecise idea. However, as the idea becomes solid, my hand will start to, start to take shape and I'll start to express my idea. And as that idea becomes a fine point, my hand comes down to the fine point, and I create the fine idea. What is truth? It is this. Who is God? Christ. What is the mystery of our faith? He was born ministered amongst us, died, resurrected. Oop, there's my fingers identifying. Communicating thought and precise idea from a general idea. I communicate mass. A large, a medium, and a small. Now that can be 100 million, 100,000, and 100, or it can be 10, 5, and 1. The hands are relative. The space is relative. So I create space, spatial relation, a mass relationship by my hand position inside of it. If I also look at the hand, and I think of that as a power radiator in the palm here, then I, if I think of the hand posed this way, then this is a forceful giving of, of expression toward an audience. If I think of it this way, it is a real comforting of that power toward myself. So when the speaker goes like this, they're comforting themselves, associating themselves, identifying self. When the palms are outward from the body, I'm expressing an idea toward you or creating a barrier between you and I. So am I giving you something or stopping? Now, this, is we're going to talk about rhythm in just a second but that idea that that pose creates this barrier if you want to give don't give here okay this stops this impose this blesses puts on top okay, so you could you can bless this way certainly this is much more that 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 that, that wall that appears okay soften the touch don't touch flat touch the top of their head. So if I come down here, that's a better thing than there. Okay? You can see that, that this is, is, is much more, uh, in some ways, aggressive blocking than touching. So I touch, and it's a soft hand, not a flat hand, because I'm not trying to impose a flat hardness on them, but rather a soft idea. So I can, I can reach to you here not here. Feel the difference of that? Okay, soft hand, not hard hand. Now, if I want to stop them, then I can do it. Speak to the hand. <laughs> <laughs> However, this is when you are blessing, and this is much more as if you're touching the, 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 the heads of your congregation. Okay. And that calmly, and we'll talk about the rhythm in a second. But if you want to give them an idea, open it up. Instead of giving it this way, give it to them that way. And here I take what is mine. It's got Mikey Don and, and, and the hand position. I take that which is mine and I give it to you. Uh, that which God has for us and I give it to you. Now the unfolding of the hand itself is that unfolding idea that is extended toward the congregation. Now notice my posture is also forward, that extended idea. And then it's laid in the hand as if they could reach forward and take it. Whereas this, you drop it on them, they don't have a choice. Here, I'm giving them the idea, you can take it. And I can lay it down before them and leave it there. There it is. So I give that which I want them to take. I bless which that which they could not take, but I can give. And I stop. With just my hand. 
the general idea, the fine point, the orientation of self. Now, since we're on orientation, I'm going to go ahead and pause into one area, discomfort gestures, and you all have them. And you need to identify them and cast them out into utter darkness. <laughs> Those comfort gestures are physiologically real. In other words, it really does itch. No, I really, it really wasn't straight. Okay, no, my ring was really bugging me. Those comfort gestures are what happens when you're in the middle of your speech and all of a sudden you go, where on earth am I? <laughs> and he said, did I really just say that? <laughs> and all of a sudden you have to scratch. <laughs> that communicates to anybody, oh wow, a couple of things. First off, the comfort gesture to yourself also says what he's saying is really just automatic. And it has ceased to be lived. Because there's something else that has a priority. His little elbow. <laughs> oh, wow. She's not really sure if she believes that. Oh, she's thinking about that to say, did she say that right? You're broadcasting yourself instead of your text. And most of the time, you don't want to do that. Now, in today's world, in our postmodern, you know, we sit on a chair and lounge about and, you know, drink our water and, you know. All right, if that's your style and you want to be relaxed, use your comfort gestures. But many times in our presentation, we're trying not to do all the comfort gestures. And instead, we're trying to communicate just our texts and our ideas. Realize that comfort gestures distract from your principal text and try to identify your comfort gestures and eliminate them unless they're truly, absolutely necessary. And I can guarantee you the itch is a trick of your mind. Unless you have poison ivy. It's a trick of your mind to comfort yourself. And the other place that we see comfort gesture is this hand position. These orientations towards self, which include the hands here, the hands here, the backing away, the hands in front. Now, some of those are postures of comfort, and sometimes I do that to allow my audience to think <clears throat> or to observe me. But be aware of them that this is closing off your audience, and this is saying, I, I have a script, I am leaving your conversation and our conversation and entering into my own. Okay. All right. Comfort gestures. Next thing the chest. Now, the chest is an area <clears throat> that we all have. And <laughs> think about it, is that chest is a very, very communicative part. Uh, in French mime, and in fact, in much of movement, the, the expression finds itself here, well, first in the stomach and then through the chest. But the chest is the external vision of the way you feel, think, uh, the way they understand of your emotional state. And so if you stand up here and you're proud and you're giving outward, Obviously, that's the one thing. Whereas if you're tired and drained and sad and depressed, it goes down. Usually, we think of positive emotion or extrovert, exterior expressions as a lifted chest, an internal focused or depressed or negative emotion as a sunken chest. So you really want to have a, a position that just pulls up full and, and steady and not dropped and or overextended. So that if I'm talking about something sad, I can go there. If I want to uplift the people to the joy of the Lord, I can go there. And each of those emotions you do preach on. Sometimes you're talking about repentance and you need to be down. And sometimes you're talking about that release and you need to be up. And that chest shows it. Let me show you what my, the difference would be of not using your chest and using your chest. Here's this idea that I have already established of giving. Here's the, just the giving with a hand. And I talk about, I'm going to give this, and I'm going to bless you. And there's the glory of God. Now, what I've done is only established an external intellectual understanding of the ideas of giving, blessing, and the glory of God. Because it's only externally done. It's done just with my hand. Here. 
or even there to impose, or there's the glory of God, or you know, there's the thing I give. The difference between giving and giving. Between seeing God's glory, or speaking of God's glory, and speaking of God's glory. Of taking, or of taking. The strength is exponential. It's amazing how much more strength there is. And the giving that leans and involves the body than the, just that external thing. One, I have the idea, but no heart, no emotion, no, no power. And the other, all of a sudden, it comes to life. Use the chest. You know, to say the joy of the Lord is the joy of the Lord. To say that place of repentance and sufferance. Our repentance and sufferance. This looks like I'm lifting weights or something. <laughs> so that body inclusion creates a support of the word that says what the words do not. And take the intellectual idea and makes it manifest and visual. So the hand alone needs to be, the hand should be an extension of the chest, not the end of your expression. And when the hand is only an extension of itself, it'll communicate the intellectual idea, but your audience will always read it as contrived. And we know all of you don't want to be contrived. How do I make my gestures so they're not contrived? I make sure that they're living from inside and going to the out. And that physically is created with the inclusion of the chest and the motion. Okay? Deeper of that would be the, the stomach, which is the seat of the soul, the concept of the seat of the soul, the, the appetite, the desires in the Greek. And then from there, I can lift into something. So when something grows there, it's so much more powerful. And when something includes that whole body expression, it becomes so much more powerful than just something that's here. So that the uplift, if you want to raise your audience, your congregation up here, that is going to lift them up as they empathize with you. Oh, you know, so you can do this and you can intellectually communicate that idea as well, and that's fine, because sometimes it's just an intellectual idea is up or down, but sometimes it's an uplifting of them. And as I include that gesture, they feel that, oh, of being that lift of being, just with the chest. Well, <clears throat> we shall go on. We've done the waist, the chest. We've done the hands. We've done the feet, the pelvis. <laughs> I went to a church, and they had expressive arts there at the church, and they wanted to have dance, but no pelvises, please. <laughs> you know, it's like, the only problem was the dancer was like this. <laughs> And so, because we weren't supposed to focus on the pelvis, she didn't worry about it. <laughs> and we did. <clears throat> pelvis is an interesting thing, because it's a, a very, von it's our vulnerability, not only gender identification, but direction identification. And many times, we disconnect our legs from our upper body, where we're going from where we are. And the pelvis shows that orientation. For instance, if I'm speaking to you here, what am I really saying to the congregation? I want to be going there. <laughs> Get me off the stage. <laughs> so my, my legs and my pelvis needs to be focused to where I'm giving. Okay? And it needs to turn the whole body and not just this. Because here, I'm still directionally that way. And it becomes very obvious that there's a quirk when you have that, that hard reach. Now, when I am moving this direction, but I want to bring you along, I might do that and return to the direction like I did in the sermon. But when I wanted to speak to you directly, I spoke to you directly here and opened myself up. And when I wanted to close me off, I turned away from that and then redirected you. So that body shows vulnerability, that, that pelvis position, direction and space, and the orientation. Mm -hmm. 
It shows that idea of where I am going, where I come from, where I'm including you, how much I'm protecting within that, that, that space. All right. The head, switching back up. How does this symbol of authority, we see Jesus as the head, not the pinky. Now, that's so ingrained in our thinking, we don't even think about it. It's just a natural association that the head represents authority, leadership, possession. So when my head is engaged in something, it might project forward. As I engage in the thought, enter into the idea, pulls back to a neutral and pulls away to allow you to think. I can look down on you or up at you. And all those head positions start to involve two things. The head position is going to show orientation of the senses or a, a orientation of authority. Those two ideas. Orientation of authority means that when my head is over here, I'm speaking to you. And when my head's over here, I'm speaking to you. And then I can directly address something or pull away. So there's my authority giving, giving concept and idea to specific areas in the crowd. However, it is also an a indicator of, of uh, the senses. And this is how it works. If I hear something, I'll cock my head toward that which I hear. So I can talk about, and then he heard. And simply by cocking my head, I say the idea physically that he heard. Then she said, and I cock my head to say what she did. Okay? So cocking the head indicates hearing, obviously. Same thing with sight. I saw, he saw, I have my vision. I look, and where I look is what I see. Smell is done by passing the finger in front of the nose. And taste is touching the lips. So the communication of something that tastes is to touch the lip. To smell is just to pass the finger in front of the nose or to lift the nose with a gesture, an op a rounding gesture of the hand. So I smell something. Or I taste something. So if we're talking about the thirsty, I might touch my lip. Or the hungry touch their stomach. Obviously, we all sort of know that pantomime dumb show. All right, but let's say that now I've established all these meanings in my body. Oh, great. So I, now I'm worried about my body and I walk up like this. You know? Oh, no, my hands. Oh, my feet. Oh, my head. Uh, the awareness is the first step to gaining knowledge. So as you learn it, think about it. Watch your own video of yourself and say, well, what, is my, what am I saying there? What's standing out? What, what is my body communicating to the observer? Wow, you know, I remember being really nervous. <laughs> Look what my stance was. Wow, I was really revealing it. Or maybe it wasn't. Maybe you thought you looked nervous, but you were calm because you still pulled up and, and solidly there. Now, that is not a comfort gesture. That's me fixing my mic. <laughs> Next thing, though, is we start to, let's say we've got that space. We've got our bodies down. Okay, we're going to work on our bodies, Todd. Let's go on. We have an empty space. Like us mimes, we preachers don't have a lot of props. We have our Bible, our notes. Uh, nowadays, we can throw something up on the screen. But let's talk about just us, not all the things that we can use. We'll do that later today. This space is given to us as the theater of our ministry, that place upon which we stand. And we create in that space significance. We have a podium that stands in the center. And from that, <clears throat> from that center, we have... <clears throat> A left, a right and a left, and a center place. We have places of thought. So I can already start to create in space associations. First idea, second idea, third idea. If you noticed, when I spoke this morning, I spoke about that God has spoken to us by the prophets and multiplied visions for us and have appealed to us through parables acted out. And in doing so, I created three significant spaces for us to associate an idea. And by giving it spatial relationship in the congregation, they have a visual support, an outline, that supports my three points. And then when I refer back to my first point, which was which? 
Uh, God speaks to us. How? Word, what was over here? Do you remember now? Parables acted out. Now I'm starting to create significant space. Words, vision, parables acted out. So whenever I want to refer back to the three voices of God, I can do it just orally or audibly. I'm up here preaching, and all of a sudden my text happens to be Matthew on the sheep and the goats. And the sheep are on his right, but the goats on his left. And Jesus turned and said to the sheep, Blessed are ye, you, for you visited me when I was sick, comforted me. And to the goats he said, But you, unfortunately, you shall go to hell, because you did not visit the sick or feed the goats. And then he spoke to the... Oh. And then the, who responded? I have space. And I have significance. Now for the rest of the sermon, I want to know, are you, are, are you a goat? Now, that does two things. I've created significant space, and so they have clear ideas. Whenever I say something positive, I go over here. Whenever I go somewhere negative, I go over here. And then I start to create that, so they go, okay, he's going to speak something about what I should be doing. Okay, now she's going to be speaking about something I shouldn't be doing. Okay, now she's going to be eliminating my, my, what is good in God and the blessings. Oh, now she's going to be speaking about what is condemned. And just in that space, I've created positive, negative. And then they're going to start jumping ahead of me. When I start to turn this way, they already know where I'm going. They don't have to catch up. And they're excited that they know where I'm going. And they're engaged in what I'm saying because I've created significant space. Another way to create significant space is by your focus. Just a little exercise. Put your finger in front of you, focus on your finger, and then take it down and leave your eyes focused on the same space. A little bit difficult, eh? Put your finger back up, see if it still worked. Oh, refocus. Okay, look at your finger, take it down, leave your, your focus there, put it up. Now, I can create characters on stage in three different manners, and you can create absent objects on the podium, pa platform area with three different techniques. One is by seeing them in the space. In other words, you can see that Jesus is over there and he's going to walk this way. And sometimes we just talk about Jesus walking this way, and we're looking at the audience and the only thing that is identifying Jesus walking is my hand. And Jesus came over here and, and said to John. Or I could look and as if I see Jesus. And that's a little bit of mime technique, perhaps more than you want to use. But that focus on it, you don't even have to do this here, identifies the rhythm of, as well as the position of. So I see somebody walking. Now in this case, like I did this morning, that person can be there and I can identify them by having my hand or body part identify the missing object. And at that point, I don't have to look at it anymore because you see the person walking beside me as I did this morning. And then they fell, and as soon as they left my hands, I followed them with my head so that they were still existing in your mind's eye. As they fell, out of my arms, I watched them with my head, and then I could leave them there and refer back to them, as I did. Because your mind is going to leave the object where you last saw it. Okay? That's identifying an object in space. So I'd have Jesus here, and John there, and then Jesus says to John, and then I can step over here and be John. And then I can step over here and be Jesus. And I no longer have to say, and Jesus said, and John said. I can simply step into the space and communicate those characters because I've established them in space. Established them inside. Okay, significant space. Usually, in many of my pieces, I'll create a God spot. It's a place above the congregation where we have oh, the character or the individual talking to God. Um, but you can also create the negatives and the positive, a whole group of sheep and a whole group of goats, but that would be dangerous because you're saying this side is going to heaven and this side. <sighs> so be careful with your uh, spatial associations. 
rhythm. Last thing I'm going to cover, and then we're going to open up for questions that you might have on some of the difficulties that you have as a speaker and presenting your body in public communication. Rhythm, we all use. For instance, tell me what is the rhythm of a shock? Is it fast or slow? Fast. Tell me what is the rhythm of calm? Fast or slow? Slow. Interesting. We already know that rhythm communicates thoughts and ideas. And the rhythm of our speech, we know, communicates a calm and collective. Or that the person who's just really is really all over the place and they're really making us really frantic and we're really, really nervous about what they're going to say and whether or not they're going to be able to continue to speak. <laughs> the hand also. If I go here, I'm sorry to woke you up. <laughs> That thrust, accompanied with the word, creates an energy and a sense of excitement and stops. Because all gestures shouldn't be here. All gestures shouldn't be just that floating hand there as we float off and la 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 la. <laughs> no, slow gestures are for those things which we're contemplating. Those things which we're thinking. Fast gestures are for those things that call to action or react. Slow, meditative, fact, fast, responsive. Fast is also comic, so you have to be careful. Slow is usually graceful or associated with things, gestures of grace. So is that gesture needing to be imposed? Is it forceful or is it gentle? Is it a reaction or is it a pondering? And your words are usually going to have, your sentences are going to have a rhythm sense. So as I look at my text, I can analyze it for its rhythm sense. And read in, is, this a, is my body calm? Or do I need some aggravation in there? Is this something that there's a sense of expectation? There's sort of that, that boiling. Or am I just wanting to say, wait, think about it. Now notice how you respond viscerally to this, this character here who's, who's, who's just really, and it's, it's very important and I'm very passionate about this. This. What are you going to do about it? <laughs> Learning to say what you mean with your rhythm, as well as your gesture, as well as your words. And you already know this because you know when you need to speak faster and when you need to speak slower. You know when you need to lift your volume and when you need to lower your volume. And those are generally associated with the same rhythm patterns. A higher volume is usually going to have a greater intensity of body. Well, that calm volume is going to have a slower and more controlled rhythm of the body. Let them echo and you will have double the force, double the strength. Now inside of that, let me just show you one practical way that the rhythm comes to an end in a punctuation. I could say no, and there the no is just a simple stop. No. Or I might be more emphatic, no. That's called a tuck, just a spasm of muscle at the end of the movement, where we make a robot. <laughs> Anyway, um, <clears throat> but that, that tuck goes, no, no, or even a, a, a very ex exclamatory, no, that the rhythm and the tuck at the end, no, no, no. Okay, now it needs to stop, because if I go, no, I maybe. <laughs> See, it works with rhythm. All right, we're going to go ahead and take some time for questions. And uh, what problems do you have when it comes to physicalizing the sermon and body communication? I have a question about the I, Oh, I'm sorry. If we could use the mics, it would be very beneficial for the sake of being able to review this later on. I have a question about the right-left gestures, uh, sheep and goats. Should you do gesture to your own right and left or the audience's right and left? Normally you want to think of the audience's right and left. Uh, but it, once you've established the space, it doesn't matter. 
Once you establish uh, a significant space, it will be that space. But if you're referring, you can also say to your right or to your left, or to his right or to his left, and then you would use whichever one you had indicated, and it won't make that much difference. Uh, as long as you keep consistent thereafter. So if you're referring to their right, always therefore thereafter refer to their rather than his or yours. Okay. Other questions that you might have? And again, please, you're welcome to approach the mics and line up or not. There's a lot of talk these days about being conversational in nature with your audience that makes them feel comfortable. Part of that sometimes is being in a seated position for part of the sermon. Can you talk about what that communicates or anything Certainly. that we'd need to know? Certainly. The, the fact of the matter is that, again, we were, I made a slight joke about it, but not, not to belittle that particular style. Uh, to use a, a chair lowers my body into a completely relaxed position. And so what I am saying to my congregation is that I'm inviting you to my living room. And you know, you got a chair, you got a little table there, a lamp and your water. And you're just saying, hey, I'm just wanting to talk to you. Now, there are sermons that, let's just, as it were, get real. Let's sit down and chat. And that type of sermon works if your gestures and your your mode of communication and your topic fit that discussion. Uh, but there are other topics in which that isn't the case. A stool might be used. Now a stool, in which case I'm sitting at a higher place, is uh, being higher up off the ground also avails me the ability to get up easier. So a stool is seen much more for the person who's presenting a lecture or a conversation. They're still above but at this point, they're presenting an idea as a teacher. And at any point, they're ready to get up and converse and to change the nature from a seated conversation to, no, this is what I know and you need to know it. The standing position is a position of tradition, but it is also a position of open reading and it gives me the maximum amount of communication skills. In a seated position, I'm basically relying on my upper chest my head and my hands. In a standing position, I could use my whole body. Therefore, even in a relaxed, get real situation, I would rather stand in front of you than sit. Okay? With the exception of, of let's go to my living room, sit down and have a chat. Then a chair or a couch or a nice overstuffed chair becomes a, a viable form of communication. And you really have to say, what is the demand of the text? And what is the necessity of your communication and physical engagement inside of that text? In which case, even for the most progressive of churches, there would be times when I would say, have a pew, I mean, have a pulpit, and other places, have a chair. And other, have neither, and allow me to roam. Okay? Yes, I noticed that you keep your jacket buttoned, so I have two questions. One, if you're wearing a jacket, should it be kept but buttoned? What's the significance of that? And the other one is, I notice you never touch the podium. Can the podium ever be touched or tapped on? Is there any effectiveness in using that at all? Or is it always keep your hands off the podium? Think of it as a hot iron grid that you can't touch. No, the podium itself, well, first off, if you know, neither one of these, this is not a podium. But were this to be a podium, the, one of the things that we suggest to all preachers when I, when I teaching homiletics, is to approach, get your, your, have preset your notes and your Bible, and to actually come and lightly touch the, the podium itself. To look down at your notes, take a moment to look at your congregation, breathe, re-look at your notes, and then begin. Okay, a lot of times we approach our, our, the, that, that preaching space to uh, frantically and we don't give the, the congregation a starting place and we don't give ourselves a starting place whereas just approaching it and I go ahead and touch so that this is part of what I am saying and then I begin now once I do that depending on this case oh, oh, uh, oh. In this case I don't have a, a viable surface to actually use where this a podium I could make points I could be emphatic on the surface. 
But realize that a lot of the times this should never be your comfort zone. And that's the danger of it, that this becomes your comfort zone. This can be a communicative part of my presentation is here. This means to the congregation, I am organized and I am prepared and I take seriously my job to teach you. Therefore, I have notes. But it should never become my comfort gesture of, are they really straight and do I need to have it right next to the edge or in the middle? <laughs> okay. And many times that's what happens to a podium is a podium becomes a place of security. <laughs> it needs to be the extension of your preparation and a place from which a, a place of speaking. Therefore, it becomes part of you and it can identify and help isolate space. And that's why I was saying, if I wanted to lean against this, which this one I wouldn't, I want to lean against this. I could, to say on this side, I think about that. But, you know, the other side of the issue is here. <coughs> now I'm using the podium as part of the physicalization and the con to make concrete my ideas. And I can create the concrete idea where this is the balance center. So I can create it as a significant space and, and should create it if I'm going to use one. It should be part of my significant space. And no problem with just laying the hands gently on this side. You know, here, that's a little bit casual. To this side, unless you're going to reach over and beyond the idea to whisper a secret and then return back to our right. Let me tell you something. All right. Onward we go. All right. So, no, I wouldn't handle it as a hot potato, uh, but I do handle it as a significant space. Um, you were to say something about the jacket. But oh, the jacket, the jacket. Well, jacket is a, a matter of question. physical preference. I mean, here, you know, I could take this off and I have my, my, my nice shirt underneath and, and there you have it. Um, but it's a matter of, of uh, specifically what you're trying to communicate. A flapping jacket, though, looks like wings trying to take off. So um, it depends on the cut of your, sh your, your, your coat, for me as a, as, as a gesturalist. Here, having my button open, this hides my body line. And I don't like things that hide my body line. Because I'm trying to communicate here, and now I've got this, you know, you know. <laughs> And so, therefore, if I'm going to wear a coat, I'm going to have it buttoned, unless it's, it's tailored such where it's not going to go flapping. Um, obviously, given our, our varied environment, some of us don't wear three-piece suits, some of us don't wear ties, and, uh, and some of us, you know, in California will come in shorts. And each of those communicates something very specifically to your audience. Yeah. And, and that's very, very important. That was, that was just to pick up the question you, from the previous speaker. Now I have my question. Okay. Um, actually, I have a number of questions, but I'd like to uh, uh, thank you for a very engaging and helpful lecture. And uh, uh, there's lots of things that, that you've brought up that are worth thinking about and working on. Um, my particular issue has to do with the fact that there are a variety of sanctuaries that we preach in, and I really struggle in sanctuaries where people are all around you. Oh, yeah. And I don't know what to do about eye contact. I don't like turning my back on people. And I don't know how to do that very well. And I'm just wondering if you have any suggestions about how you can preach in the round. Absolutely. First off, just go ahead and quadrant. Make it instead of a round, make it in quadrants. So that you know you have a quadrant here, a quadrant there, a quadrant there, and a quadrant there. And realize that if I enter, that there's a top of that quadrant that I can go to and deal with it. Second thing is go ahead and put your major ideas for each quadrant so that in the process everybody gets touched. And those ideas which are universal, go ahead and start the sentence here and end the sentence there and allow it to do. So what I do is I, I, I see preaching in the round as, as a mandatory creation of significant space. And so I have to create my ideas one, two, three, and four, and then I have to refer back to those ideas. Or if it's a general thing and I don't want to condemn everybody, then I'll, I'll do it in that sweeping gesture. But go ahead and preach here, and then practice in your notes, if you use, whether that's 
uh, a manuscript and or the extemporaneous outline, go ahead and say here and make sure to turn over here and finish the idea. And sometimes you want to go ahead, if, if it's your major point, you want to start the idea here and finish it there so that the idea carries over. Sometimes the choir is Sometimes, well, the choir, the choir realizes they're the victim, so. <laughs> so, uh, however, having said that, I did preach uh, when I was in, um, I will open myself up here for the choir. And so when I'm preaching, I simply change my angle to include the choir, at least in the profile. So that my preaching is no longer, this is no longer my zero, but that becomes my zero. And I preach this way, and I preach that way. Now that's, that's as a guest speaker, I feel, I feel obliged to make sure that the, the choir is included. But many times, like I said, on a normal Sunday, they're used to being, seeing your back. <laughs> You know, in which case it, it can be there. But, but remember them on significant points as well, would be my advice. All right? Last two questions, and then I think it's time for us to break, if I'm not mistaken. Well, I have two questions. One of them okay. is um, more theoretical, and the other pretty mundane. The theoretical question, and I'm wondering for a congregation, well, let me back up. When you had engaged just your hands and not your chest, I, I noticed, um, I felt more vulnerable. You know, it, it, it was as if you were drawing me into um, your world more than when you just used your hands. And for most of our congregations, I would think that, that we're sort of used to that more external... Um, um, Physicalization. You, exactly. And, and so if we begin to internalize the, the feeling more and engage, you know, various parts of our bodies rather than just our hands, it might feel more um, like a performance or, or, or um, foreign, perhaps. How, how, do you, how do you deal with that, um, that concern that people might have that this becomes more to performance even even as you go through your manuscript or you go through the text and and you you try to find the various places of rhythm or, or where you might be able to um, really punctuate something through your body how how does it not become co contrived feel deeply the way luther referred to it he says as far as gesture goes feel deeply in other words when i communicate the idea it isn't something that is external to me. It's something that I believe. And if I believe it, and they believe in my sincerity, then I'm not an actor. I, I am reenacting, bringing back to life texts all the time. And in that way, but I'm trying to act truth and truthfully. And, and so they know you're not Peter. They know you're not psalmist. But when you read that psalm, it's as, it's as if you were David crying out to God. And if you read that with your passion and your belief, and so those gestures aren't something that I put on to hear, you understand what I... Risk. You know, we don't, no one wants that. Mm -hmm. So the answer to the question is, feel deeply. Mm -hmm. So that it comes from you to them and then they see the sincerity of it, and then we'll believe you. Now, granted, something like what I did this morning, that extreme, will, that, that critique could be something that I face. Mm -hmm. Wow, you know, that's just really, well, but that's also who I am, and I do, I hope, believably. I hope I put what I believe inside of it. Mm -hmm. And that's what we need to do as speakers. Every time you get up to read a text, you are performing. And all that means is through the form. You're putting a message through a form. That is performing. And the degree of which that is honestly done is the degree of truthfulness and authenticity that we receive from it. But when you perform through that form and it feels contrived because you're all external or because it's forced, then we have resistance. Thank you. Okay. Um, also, I'm wondering if you could comment on your experience with high heels and, <laughs> and robes. 
yeah, what, what, is, what does that convey? Sometimes when I wear my heels and, and I move my body, I find myself um, off balance. And, and when you were up, like the, the guard, and sort of lofty, does that get conveyed at all with, with heels? And Absolutely, then, sure. Yeah? A woman, uh, uh, men or women in um, elevated shoes, um, what happens is there is a statement of height, for one. So it's a statement of, of size and measurement. So a lot of times it can become a question of expressed power. So sometimes for me to try to be higher is for me to try to be taller, for me to try to be more dominant in height. Um, however, high heels and elevated surfaces can also result in insecurity and balances, and then you appear insecure. Mm -hmm. So if you're not secure inside of your high heels, <laughs> um, you, that's going to read. Right. So make sure that your shoes give you a sense. Uh, uh, the sense of empowerment is fine. Uh, you know, I, I knew a one m m woman who was uh, four foot two, and she was a powerhouse, but she had like six foot, six inch, <laughs> still, you know, little heels on to give herself some kind of sense of lift. Mm -hmm. Fine, that's fine. But be secure in it and, and allow that to become your new base. And then also with big robes, our right. church um, is, uh, uses robes like sure. G Genevan, flowy kind, and, and any comments on that? Um, no, if, if the congregation is used to a liturgical robe as the form of ministry, then that robe and its cloth and its rhythm is participating inside of the turn. And just realizing that that is creating a rhythm pattern, an association, uh, a visibility or, or a hides visibility, you just work within the fabric. You know, whatever that fabric is. Again, sort of the comment of coat or no coat, sh sh you know, trousers or shorts. Uh, all of those things have different rules and regulations. Last question, then. Yes, some church has a relative uh, a big podium uh -huh. and the anchor mic, you don't have wireless. Right. They don't see you down here, and if you leave the podium to show, they don't hear you. Any tips for that? Well, yeah, get a wireless. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, buy your own, bring it to church. <laughs> um, and I would. Uh, but obviously, there's still the ability to speak here and allow yourself to angle the body. Then it becomes a position of, of hands and allowing the body to express itself in this way. So I am still completely able to... I have preached, this, preached sitting down, and I have preached with only a mic. And I also have the ability to project. So I can still project toward my mic from either side. But then my first thought would be over here, facing center, instead of facing away. Like, on this side was this, and on this side was that. Now it would be, on this side was this, and on that side was that. All right? So you'd still use it within a relative space. Thank you very much for your time. I think you're here. <laughs>